don't want to be blinded. Okay, hi. It is so wonderful to be in this room with all of you here. Thank you for taking the time out of your incredibly busy lives to come be here. Part of why we wanted to do this, and we've been trying to do this for a long time, is we really want to start facilitating more connection and community between all the veterinarians in our whole region. I don't have to tell you all because you do the work. I'm not a veterinarian, by the way, <laughs> but I play one on TV. <laughs> but I definitely feel a part of this community because I work with veterinarians and animals every single day. And it's been really difficult watching a lot of the hard times occurring in this profession right now. Not only do we have a nationwide shortage of veterinarians, around 12 or 13,000 nationwide at this point, but we also know we have a shortage in the entire support staff team as well. And suicide rates for veterinarians are on the rise. And these are really scary trends because the work that we do is really, really difficult. The work that you all do is really difficult. My work's difficult too, but for different reasons. <laughs> and I really wanna facilitate a community. Um, as veterinarians, y'all should be here for each other and be supporting each other and feel comfortable picking up the phone and, and asking questions of each other and talking to each other. And that hasn't necessarily always been the case. Um, and so thank you all for being here. I also want to give an update on SVCA of Northern Nevada, sort of the things that we offer now. There's a lot of you in this room that we already partner with um, through some of our programs. And so those of you who don't know what we're offering now, I, I want to just give a little insight to that and let you know that it is in fact true. I know that our organization has been very different over the years. We've been around for 22 years and it's gone through a lot of different phases and a lot of different changes. Um, and so we'll, we'll give you a little update on kind of what we're doing there. We also quickly created this affordable services flyer in the Reno area so that your clients have resources. Um, I think one of, the, one of the hardest things that we all face are the angry, frustrated clients. And they, they put that anger and that frustration in the wrong place. And it's often directed at the veterinarians and the vet mentees. So we're working with other nonprofits in our area to help provide some resources so that your clients have resources to pay their bills, to get their animals the care that they need, and hopefully reduce some of this misplaced anger that sometimes they direct towards everyone in this room. And when you have really hard days, you know, I want you to look around and at the faces of your colleagues next to you we're all here to support each other we don't we want to reduce the burnout in the veterinary medicine world and I think all of us working together as a coalition for animal welfare in general can can really help accomplish that um, there's a bunch of these on the front table so please go ahead and feel free to take one we're trying to splash them around electronically as well so if you want electronic um, copies just reach out to us and we're happy to email them to you as well um, and this is not exhaustive but this is a start <laughs> we're also building out a web page that will be shared with all of the organizations and this is not just SBCAs so this has um, you know different options from well options since I just said that word uh, NHS Nevada Humane Society Washoe County Regional Animal Services as well as SPCA and again, this is just the beginning. We really want to make it cohesive and robust. Uh, it's not a competition for us. So those of us in the nonprofit animal welfare space are really trying to get better about building a Northern Nevada animal welfare coalition. Enough with the backhanded name calling, we're better than them, we do this, they don't. It doesn't help anybody. So we're working really hard with current leadership right now to create a, a safety net. If you think of what a net looks like, that mesh, right? To help support the community. So those people who have never walked into a vet's office before, which constantly amazes me just how many in our community that's true for. Um, you know, we need a vibrant, 
thriving private vet practice because we adopt thousands of animals into this community every single year. NHS alone adopts 10,000 animals into this community a year. So we really want to partner with the private vet practice as well. It's not a, it's not a competition. We're all doing the best we can for our pets and people. And so, where was I? <laughs> My team can tell you I will philosophize about all these things all day long, but I did make notes to keep myself on track. Um, so I think, you know, running through who we are as an organization right now, I think the biggest thing for this particular room is our Todd's Medical Assistance Fund. I wanted to start this, Dr. Wilson knows, because he really helped me in the very beginning of this fund. And I'm still so grateful for your insights um, running something similar for a very long time. And I wanted to start a medical fund for people who couldn't afford their veterinary bills because when I was younger and didn't have financial resources, I had to euthanize my best friend. He was a beloved black lab whose name was Zinger. And he's responsible for getting me into animal welfare. And I had to euthanize because I couldn't pay a surgery bill for him. And he had a good prognosis. And I still get emotional about it. And it's still a point of pain and personal shame and grief. And I don't want anyone to have to experience that. And people have to experience it every single day. And then they inappropriately blame veterinarians and vet practices for being greedy and it's you know our fault that their pet is dying and, and that's really hurtful and it's really harmful and it's not true so the way that Todd's works is they can apply online if they qualify it's a pretty easy qualification process right roughly sixty thousand dollars or less as an annual income and most applicants we're seeing around eighteen thousand on average which God bless them for being able to survive, frankly, at that point on any level. Um, and then we'll pay up to 80% of the medical costs that their animal is facing if it is within a specific um, age range and has a good prognosis, right? Which, a good pro we do our best. There's no guarantees. And then if they have a difficult time coming up with the remaining 20% that they're responsible for, our team acts as animal social workers, so they cobble together resources, right? They reach out to existing partners that we have. Um, they work with Washoe County Regional Animal Services CARES program to get money through that. We'll reach out to Shakespeare Fund to see if they can contribute. Really just trying to put all these resources together. Um, how many in this room have heard of Todd's Medical Fund or worked with us? Look, it's all our partners. <laughs> I love it. We're so grateful to all of you. And I ask just because we work really hard to try to get the word out, right? But there's a lot of noise in, in our environment these days, and it's hard to get it out. So those of you who aren't familiar with it, this is a resource where if someone comes into your clinic and their dog has a broken leg or needs surgery to remove a mask or some fancy medical term I'm not going to pretend to know because that's why the vets talk after I do. <laughs> this is a resource that you can have them just sign up for and they can get the money. We pay the money directly to the clinic. Um, another reason why I wanted to ask is because we've had some situations where a vet clinic doesn't believe the person and when our team calls them or emails them, they don't, they don't believe it. And we've even been hung up on a few times. And I get it, like I said, SBCA of Northern Nevada, like so many nonprofits, has been through lots of different phases in its existence and evolution. And there was a time we couldn't pay our own bills, let alone the bills of other people. But I want you to know that it's legitimate and that we do a lot of hard work fundraising for it. And we have fantastic financial support. And this is a way that we can partner together with private veterinary clinics to get help to the animals who need it and relief to the pet parents who love them. So that's on our website, it's on this page, um, and that, again, is a resource. Uh, we have our affordable vaccine and spay neuter clinics. We have a help desk. Um, NHS has a help desk as well, so people who are having behavioral issues or health issues, they can call, and the, our organizations will help direct them to what they need. 
So those are resources you can share with your clients as well. Um, especially when it comes to more training behavior things. Um, we also run a shelter feeding program. So we feed 40 other nonprofit organizations in our area. We have a big Mack truck. It goes out to a bunch of different corporate partners and we get food that way. We distribute it through other nonprofits and those nonprofits go into their communities, most of whom are rural Northern Nevada communities and further distribute the food to individual families there. Um, so if people are needing resources, you know, that's, that's a opportunity. Washoe County Regional Animal Services and Nevada Humane Society also offer food banks to individuals. Um, so please keep that in mind. Washoe County has free microchipping for all Washoe County residents. It's amazing. It, tell all your clients about it, please, because we know microchips are key to getting pets home safely. Some of you may not know this. Washoe County has an incredibly high return to owner rate. So high, in fact, that Washoe County for the last five years continues to be a leader in our nation for that. I get chills every time I see it. We're used in national conferences from HSUS's Expo to Best Friends Conference that they hold. So we have a lot to be proud of. Shan Scholl, who's the director of Washoe County, does an incredible job. I'm on the advisory board. I help her finding grants and different things. So we're working really hard to help get these resources into the community so that pets can get home and so pets can stay home and stay out of the shelters. Um, and so that you all have additional resources that you can be providing to your clients. Um, you know, we work with CRCS, which is the Canine Rehabilitation Center in Washoe Valley. We work with Pet Network up in Incline. Um, we work with a whole bunch of home-based foster groups that we're fortunate enough to have in our area and we we specifically work primarily with the northern rural municipalities and home-based fosters up there just give you an idea of what our place in it is um, i also want to introduce sam sam is from heel and he is available after the presentation if anyone has questions for them. We are partnering with HEAL to offer a grant opportunity for veterinarians who are interested in running their own mobile practices. Uh, the grant actually helps you get the practice off the ground for the first three years in exchange for providing care to uh, low income families. And he has information on that as well. So talk to all your colleagues about it. Did I mention that there's a vet shortage? <laughs> Does, is anybody in this room unaware of that? <laughs> uh, the last time I looked just on, on Indeed, which is one platform, there were, I think, 16 job postings for veterinarians just for Reno. And that's not including the larger northern Nevada region. Um, so, we, you know, take care of yourselves. <laughs> we need you all desperately. Um, and also we're starting a TNR program. So we're working closely with NHS's team um, and we're working closely with, remind me the name of your practice. Thank you, Riverside and Carson. Um, and with lots of volunteers because we know we need more services for TNR. Um, so that we'll get that information out. And again, as people, because I'm sure you guys get a lot of calls about I found this stray cat and my neighbor's feeding all these cats and what do we do? So we're working really hard to get those resources out to the community. Um, I've already talked longer than I promised that I would. So I wanna make sure I get all the big items. Um, are there any questions for me before I turn it over to the experts? Not a single question? <laughs> No one's gonna ask me how the city council meeting went last night? <laughs> Other than my team? Okay. <laughs> no, nobody knows about it? <laughs> what? <laughs> I appreciate that. Okay, no questions for me, that's great. Please pick up, again, the sheet on your way out and thank you so much for being here. And I'm very pleased to introduce our lead veterinarian, Dr. Christine Hansen and Dr. Healy. And they're going to 
see far more interesting things, I'm sure. But I hope you guys kind of have a general outlay now of where animal welfare coalitions exist in Northern Nevada and how we all can work together. And also, a round of applause for my son. He's very, 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 well, I don't know if I can say it much better than Jill, um, but tonight the goal was to gather uh, our private practitioners and our shelter veterinarians and staff all in one place to just talk about what we do. Um, the shelter world has changed so much in such a short amount of time. A lot of people are confused about what shelters offer and how they fit into the community. So we're here to just hopefully answer some of those questions and uh, and just get everybody on the same page as far as what do we do and how does it affect the community. Okay, remote. There we go. Um, <laughs> So the speakers tonight, me, Dr. Ryan Healy, and uh, Dr. Christina Hansen. So we'll start off with uh, Dr. Chris giving a little bit about her history and experience with shelter med. Hi, so yes, my name is Dr. Christina Hansen. I'm known as Dr. Chris uh, where, I, where I work and that's what I've been used to being called. Um, I'll just tell you a little bit about myself. I am a Reno transplant. I moved here about two years ago, almost two years coming up. Uh, I moved here during the pandemic, so that was interesting. Um, so my background is I'm a Colorado State grad, 2006. After um, I graduated, I went on to do a small animal rotating internship at a BCA hospital in Sacramento, California. After that, I bounced back to Colorado because it was kind of a cool place to live and I tried my hand at emergency medicine for about two years. Kinda, kinda got a little stressed out doing that job. <laughs> and decided I wanted to head back to California. So um, I did that. When I was in California, I worked in private practice and um, did relief, relief work there for about five years. Um, got a little burnout uh, and was looking for a full-time gig uh, because I was just piecing together a lot of part-time things and so um, I saw the job posting for a veterinarian at Best Friends Animal Sanctuary in Southern Utah and that sounded really interesting to me um, and so I went out and interviewed and they offered me the job so I thought what the heck we'll give it a go Southern Utah here I come <laughs> and that was my exposure to shelter medicine, and I have to say it saved, probably saved my life, to be honest with you. Um, it was just a whole new world, and I really loved it and really thrived and learned so much there. Um, and I was there for almost seven years, and uh, the reason I left was basically my family's in California and I wanted to be a little closer to home, so I was looking for job opportunities in the Northern California area. And I saw the SPCA website and thought, that looks like a cool place to work. And lo and behold, they were hiring, so that, that magically happened. And I do want to mention, um, I do not have a... I'm not a board certified shelter vet. Shelter vet. I haven't done a certification or a master's degree. <laughs> um, so I'm not. I'm not an expert, but I do have about nine years of experience in shelter medicine. So that's where, that's where the talk's coming from, you know. And we see new things every day. And even just in the last two years that I've been here, I've I've learned some new some new things too. So we're learning learning all the time. Um, I am also a uh, high quality, high volume shelter, I mean, spay and neuter veterinarian. I've been to Puerto Rico three times with the Spayathon for Puerto Rico. Amazing experience. It's really sad to me that they have discontinued that program. Um, I've also gone to the Galapagos with an organization called Animal Balance 
and done spay and neuter there for them. And I highly encourage any and all of you to explore those opportunities and volunteer if you can, because they're, they're amazing on, on all kinds of levels. So that's me. Dr. Right. Ryan. <laughs> that's me, uh, Dr. Ryan Healy. I'm a native Nevadan, born and raised here in Reno. So of course I went to uh, UNR for my pre-veterinary training. A lot of my fellow classmates are here right now, which is really exciting and just shows how small the veterinary community can be. Um, from there, I went to Washington State, go Cougs for any Cougs in the room. Uh, graduated in 2018 and really wanted to move home because the Palouse is very dark and rainy in the winter and I was waiting for some Nevada sunshine. Um, so I took my first position uh, back here in Reno at the Nevada Humane Society. Uh, I will back up and talk a little bit about what got me into shelter medicine. Uh, when I went to, went to vet school, I really wanted to be a state wildlife veterinarian. <laughs> um, so this is very far <laughs> from what I set out to do. Uh, but during school, I discovered you needed a master's or a PhD and decided uh, on top of the DVM and decided DVM was enough school for me. Um, so I uh, did some investigating and tried to figure out where I fit. Um, in the veterinary world and what I liked to do. And our uh, junior surgery, we get to do surgeries on shelter animals and I just found myself loving that whole path and getting to do surgery and uh, work with those animals that didn't have owners attached. <laughs> um, so I really liked that. <laughs> um, <laughs> so yeah, that was more my niche. Um, so from there, then I ended up at uh, Nevada Humane Society where I, I kind of call it my crash course in, uh, in shelter medicine. I learned a lot very quickly and um, decided that this was, this is what I wanted to continue to do. Uh, there was a position up at Pet Network Humane Society in Incline Village. Uh, they were having um, they were hiring for their first ever medical director. And so I decided to take a giant leap. Um, being a medical director two years out of school was a big thing to uh, jump into, but I learned a lot from that position. Um, lots of reasons why I decided to move back down to Reno, but mainly I missed um, a short commute <laughs> and then also um, working with my community down here in Reno that that meant a lot to me so um, I ended up back here okay so tonight um, is a little bit of an outline of what we're going to talk about and I just wanted to <laughs> talk a little bit about how this presentation came to be. We, we had pulled our Facebook uh, shelter, uh, Facebook shelter group um, asking, saying we're giving this talk to our community and what should we talk about? Well, we got a lot of different suggestions. <laughs> so we decided that the best place to start would be just an overview of what sheltering is, um, how it came to be, uh, what is the goal and basically what is an every what is an everyday life in in um, a shelter veterinarian's shoes um, some things are very similar to private practice and then other things are a lot different uh, so we're just gonna go over all of those things and there'll be time for questions at the end uh, so if you have anything write it down because I know if I don't write it down it doesn't happen or exist <laughs> um, and we can answer those at the end. Okay, so first we'll start a little bit, or start with a brief history of sheltering and how it came to be. So back in the colonial days on the East Coast um, in our developing country, uh, lots of livestock and farm animals would escape from the properties uh, where they were supposed to be. Um, there were designated community individuals that would go and capture these animals and bring them to the impound. Uh, so 
from there, uh, people would come back, at, or the Farmer John, Farmer Bob, whatever, would come back and get their animals, but for a fee. Uh, so that, that's how it got started. Um, but then the wild dogs, or like, I guess feral dogs and feral cats became a problem in these communities as well. So those individuals would round up those animals and bring them to this impound. The difference between the livestock and the small animals at that point in time was that there was no monetary reason for anybody to come and get them. Um, so they filled up the impound and the only way that people could deal with this po overpopulation at the time was by euthanizing. Um, and not in very, what we would consider humane ways. <laughs> Uh, so this is where, I don't know if anybody remembers, but sheltering doesn't always have the, um, it didn't always have the positive, oh, positive view that it does now. Um, I don't remember if you remember like Lady and the Tramp, the cartoon, where they're, everybody's getting chased by the dog catchers. <laughs> uh, so that's where th that, that all started. Um, but. It wasn't until the eight, or 1886 where some of the first animal, organi animal welfare organizations were developed. The very first one was the ASPCA, um, that's the American Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Animals. Um, so they were the first organization that developed to try and help this animal welfare situation that was going on. Um, they weren't actually, when they started, out to help the cats or dogs of the community. They developed for equine welfare, um, but ended up taking over this cat and dog um, overpopulation, um, I guess pandemic, you would call it. Um, okay. Okay, so... A whole century later, um, in 1970, the focus started to shift um, from the uh, livestock and shelter, or like the animals being managed um, for public safety and also private property rights um, to where they're getting provided humane care and adopting out these homeless pets. So this leads us uh, right to where veterinarians start playing a role in the sheltering world. Uh, so in the 1970s and 80s, the main issue was the overpopulation. There were just cats and dogs running amok all over the place. Um, and these pets would be within the shelter for maybe hours or days before they were euthanized. Um, so animal welfare started to become um, be developed in these facilities and they started to employ local veterinarians. So at the time, local veterinarians' main goal was to battle the overpopulation. So really they were being hired to uh, do spay, high volume spay and neuter essentially. Uh, there really wasn't any medical care being provided for the population or individual animals at all. Um, in fact, they were <laughs> being housed um, healthy animals were being housed to can, like severely contagious sick animals and the shelter workers at the time just saw no problem with that that was totally normal for them um, it wasn't until around 2001 where the association of shelter veterinarians was formed where they started um, talk veterinarians started coming together just like we are tonight and talking um, about what can we do <laughs> to help these animals um, live, live better lives, get to homes, and also get the medical care that they need um, so that they can be adopted out help, um, in a healthy state. Oh, I did skip over that um, in, it was right around the same time that uh, shelter, shelter med was being taught the very first class at Cornell um, in their vet schools. So it just beca started becoming more mainstream. Um, 2004, the first textbook was written. Um, this helped veterinarians have a standardized way of care and could they could consult um, experts 
about how do I treat this in my shelter. Um, 2008, shelter medicine programs are started to be offered in veterinary schools. Um, I know that's a big difference from, not to, not to call you out, Dr. Chris, but when we were talking about this presentation, she had no shelter training in school at all, um, where I had a rotation that I could pick to do electively. So just showing how much it's changed in a quick amount of time. Um, 2010, that's when the ASV uh, produced these guidelines for standard of care in animal shelters. Uh, and this was huge. This is like basically a Bible for any developing shelter. Um, it talks about how to keep uh, records and manage the population. It goes into how to properly design a facility, um, goes into sanitation, how to properly care mentally and medically for these pets, group housing, animal handling, how to provide humane euthanasia, and also touches on um, high volume spay and neuter, and also animal transport and public health. So it is all encompassing, <laughs> but it is very helpful um, where, when you're going through your shelter to make sure that you're on these guidelines. Um, so it's a really useful tool for veterinarians. Um, we'll fast forward 10 years and uh, shelter, shelter medicine is now a specialty. Um, in veterinary schools, they offer internships and residencies and there's actually 30 shelter med diplomats at this point. Okay. So uh, one thing I thought we should talk about is there is a myth that all animal shelters are governed by these national organizations, um, Humane Society and ASPCA being the main ones. Um, but really these organizations serve as a place for reference and also um, education. They don't provide any funding unless we specifically apply for a grant um, to the local shelters here in our community or anywhere over or anywhere in the country. Um, so even though we're the SPCA of Northern Nevada, we don't have any association with the ASPCA. So it's a common question I think people ask you. Um, so that'll lead into the various types of shelters. Uh, first one we'll talk about is municipal. That's gonna be, and I'll use uh, Northern Nevada as our main example, since that's where we're at. <laughs> um, our municipal is gonna be Washoe County. They're gonna provide animal uh, control and more of the law enforcement aspect of the welfare um, community. Um, these, this is run by the city and is major, major, uh, majority uh, paid for by tax dollars. Um, you're going to have your private shelters. That's going to be uh, SBCA, Nevada Humane, Pet Network. Uh, they are, their main source of funding are going to be donor dollars. Um, so the community giving back to us to help the pets of our community. Um, Sometimes uh, the municipal and private shelters will come together to help each other out and form a contract. Um, our main example of that in this community is going to be Washoe County and Nevada Humane. Uh, so they form um, a contract. It can vary depending on um, that individual shelter and individual municipality. It's going to be super diverse no matter where you go, um, but partnering can also help save lives. Um, and then our final type of shelter are going to be the rescues and sanctuaries. Um, a big organization that you might recognize is going to be Best Friends. Um, that falls underneath this category. They can adopt out pets, um, but the ones that aren't rehomeable and need special uh, special accommodations to live out the rest, remainder of their life, they would go to the sanctuary portion of that organization. Okay, last, before I trade it off to Dr. Chris, 
uh, we'll talk about admission. So how do pets get into the shelter in the first place? Um, there's two different main types of admission. Um, first is gonna be open admission. This is where you're gonna take anything that comes into the door. Uh, these are mainly gonna be your municipal shelters. And like I had mentioned, sometimes they will contract with private organizations. Um, and our main example here is Washoe County in uh, Nevada Humane Society. So they take anything from strays to um, medical surrenders, behavioral surrenders, uh, emergencies, it goes on and on. Uh, the admission into the shelter it can be a complex and individualized um, process. So it's best to work with those organizations uh, to find out those complexities. Uh, our second is going to be uh, selective admission. So our example, um, SBC of Northern Nevada is selective admission. These organizations um, usually will screen the animals uh, that they intake, uh, looking at the resources they're able to provide. Um, so if you are, and it'll, it'll play to their strengths. Um, so if you have a, a, a selective admission shelter that has a really strong behavioral program, maybe you'll take in more behavior type animals. Um, if you need a, a more quality vet care or high volume spay neuter and this, this shelter is really good at that, then you'll pick more of those animals. But the mission is to try and get these animals into the shelter and adopt it out as quickly as possible. All right, let me make sure I cover everything. All right, we're good. So <laughs> I'm gonna hand off to Dr. Chris and she's gonna talk about what are the goals of Shelter Vet. Great, thank you. All right, uh, I have to put my glasses on so I can see my notes. <laughs> Sorry. Um, I'm gonna <coughs> probably use my notes part of the time and not use my notes part of the time, so just bear with me. But um, before I get started talking about the medicine and the surgery that we do, I would like to just take a moment to step back and um, remind ourselves of why we're here and what our goal is. I think ideally we wouldn't need animal shelters um, because all animals would be in loving homes. But the reality is that that's not the case and we do need animal shelters. Um, but at least, at least we can, the least we can do is try to reduce or eliminate the numbers of healthy ado adoptable animals that are being euthanized in shelters. So lots of pathways to do that. Uh, we do it by reducing the number of animals coming into the shelter. And we do that by a number of different pathways. Uh, we have spay neuter, we have trap uh, neuter release programs, uh, and those are hopefully to, uh, the goal is eliminating overpopulation of animals in the first place. We can improve uh, return to owner for lost pets like Washoe County, woohoo. We do a great job here. Uh, we can reduce owner surrender and um, uh, pet retention programs will help with that. So that's programs like Jill was talking about. Is let's, let's keep those animals in the home in the first place. Um, we can get those animals adopted easier so we can have less restrictive adoption policies. And that's a really exciting part of shelter sheltering right now is, is adoption policies are changing and becoming less restrictive and becoming more of a conversation-based type adoption versus a, um, a long application that you have to fill out. All right, uh, next, oh, I have this thing, yes, there we go, okay. So um, I just want to talk about some general principles in shelter medicine. Uh, the first one is length of stay. So this is literally the amount of time the animal is in the shelter. And this is an important concept for increasing life saving of animals. Every day the animal is in the shelter, uh, it prevents another animal from being saved. Every day that animal's in the shelter, it also increases its risk uh, for getting sick or declining behaviorally. 
So this, uh, this concept really guides uh, a lot of our medical decisions. Herd health, you remember that from vet school? Large animals. Um, we, do practice, we do practice a bit of herd health and this uh, may apply more towards puppies and kittens, whole litters, may be treated all of them exactly the same way. Um, there are lots of exceptions depending on where you work and or what shelter you are in. So uh, individuals with individual problems may also be, be treated um, differently. So I'm gonna talk about our intake process at the SPCA. Uh, it varies from shelter to shelter, so I'm just gonna tell you what we do. It's probably different at uh, NHS and, and Pet Network. But um, the animals come to the SPCA from owner surrenders, our rescue partners, and are pulled from other shelters or our rural partners. We tend to work in the northern Nevada, eastern uh, Nevada and northern California areas, um, but sometimes we end up with animals from farther afield as well. Our intake team are staff members who uh, give a basic exam. They give vaccines and dewormers. And so I'll just explain about the vac vaccinations at shelters a little bit different than in private practice. So we start vaccinating at four weeks. We repeat those vaccinations every two weeks while the animal's in the shelter. And the reasons for that are we are working in a high risk environment and there's maternal antibody and interference. And then when those animals are adopted, they are switched over to the more routine uh, three to four week schedule. Deworming starts at two weeks and is given every two weeks while in the shelter. Important to note that not all animals are actually examined by a veterinarian. Um, some of them may go through the system without even seeing a veterinarian. If they are neutered and healthy and well adjusted, they may just get adopted. I keep forgetting I have this thing in my hand. Next steps. Uh, after the animals had its initial exam, intake exam, they're put on various stages uh, depending on what they need. They, uh, they may get a medical exam if they've been flagged for something, skin, check teeth, etc. Uh, they may go into foster, uh, particularly if they're young, uh, a litter of kittens with a nursing mom, uh, they go into foster for a period of time until they're old enough and big enough to come back into the shelter to be spayed and neutered and sent on their way. We confirm altered status. Basically, it's pretty easy to tell if a male is neutered, so our staff are in charge of that. <laughs> but for females, we bring them into the clinic and the veterinarian will shave their abdomen to look for a, a scar or a tattoo and confirm that yes, they are in fact spayed or not spayed. Um, the medical care uh, ranges, like I said before, from herd health to individualized care. And that's gonna depend on the situation and the shelter. And that's the way it, that's the way it is at the SPCA as well. Uh, we are lucky, we're super lucky to have a ringworm program. And I know Jill is super excited and happy about that. It used to be, and it still is in some shelters that cats get euthanized for ringworm, which is really sad because we all know that it is treatable and or even self-limiting. And so we're, we're funded uh, to, to treat these cats. So they come in and we have the time and resources to spend on them get them cleared and then adopted out. And I love this photo. This is one of our kitties getting uh, lime dip sprayed. You can tell he's nice and yellow or orange. <laughs> Smells like picture. <laughs> <laughs> All right, and then we have um, a document that we call, it's called the medical consult. And this is a document that is signed by the adopter that explains the diagnosis of the animal, any medications they may be on, and any recommended follow-up with a regular vet. 
Uh, almost all animals on medications are sent home with a medical consult as well as other special um, medical or behavior cases. We may recommend uh, follow-up care or case management with their regular veterinarian. And an example of that is we may send home a dog home, a dog home on behavior medi medications with instructions to work with their regular veterinarian to adjust or taper those medications. Too many things. More intake pathways. So I'll talk about behavior a little bit. Um, behavior evaluation is specific to our uh, facility. Not all shelters perform behavior assessments, and this depends on time, finances, resources, and philosophy at that, at that individual shelter. Uh, we give our dogs uh, 72 hours to decompress after arrival. We have a behavior team who does a behavior assessment evaluation, and um, they, they produce a, a report, essentially, of, of the findings, and that is included in the adoption paperwork. Kennel stress is a common thing in the shelter, and we like to address this early, even day one or day two when they're there, if they're barking and kind of acting like they're pretty stressed in their kennel, we'll, we'll start them on trazodone in the, sh in the shelter. Um, I put the dose up here for you. This is a high dose, high-ish, high end of the dose, I guess. Um, that's because they're, they're pretty stressed out, so we gotta, we kind of kind of meet them where they are with a, a good high dose. If you use this dose at home, they're gonna be pretty zonked on it. In the shelter, they're like, well, what was that? That's nothing. <laughs> um, so it does, it just helps to offset their stress and does not alter our uh, behavior evaluations. Next pathway for intact dogs and cats is headed to spay and neuter. And once all of that is taken care of, they are ready to go for adoption. And for our facility, our, length, our average length of stay is usually somewhere between 10 to 14 days. That depends if they're fast-tracked, they may get out of there a lot faster. And if they have a medical problem or a behavioral problem where we're doing behavior modification with them, they may end up staying a little bit longer than that. All right. Uh, the diseases seen in shelters are similar to what is seen in private practice. Uh, these lists are not meant to be uh, comp comprehensive. This is just a list of the some of the more common diseases and other odd things that are on our radar as, as shelter veterinarians. We, we see feline upper respiratory, parvo, panleukopenia, kennel cough, dental disease, stress diarrhea, parasites, feline, lower urinary tract disease. Some of the odd ones are hypothyroidism in kittens. So keep this in mind when you have a kitten that is a little bit stunted or maybe having some constipation. This is our little patient, Sully. She turned out to be a, a hypothyroid kitty. We got her on some supplementation and her foster ended up adopting her <laughs> um, and I believe she's doing well. Uh, heartworm. We don't really see it here in Nevada but it is something to keep on your radar. Uh, if we're intaking animals from uh, other areas where they might have heartworm, shelter vets need to keep, keep it on their, on their radar. Unfortunately, distemper has to go on this list. Uh, because depending on where those animals are coming from, they might be coming from a rural area where December, again, needs to kind of be on the differential list. Polyps, it's, it's kind of a big one. You've got those upper respiratory kitties that are just not getting better. They're chronic. It's time to anesthetize them and look for a polyp. Uh, swimmer syndrome. This is kind of an odd one. This is, uh, these little kittens will have, um, kind of just weak tendons around the hips. Um, I personally haven't, haven't seen this one 
um, but I put it on the list because I've definitely seen cases about, about these kittens posted on Facebook um, in the shelter medicine groups. We see uh, declawed cats with arthritis, pain, litter box aversion. Uh, so we try and help those cats out and uh, get them adopted out into homes. Uh, sometimes people are looking specifically for declawed cats, so it can be a good match. Cerebellar hy hypoplasia, uh, mostly in cats, occasionally in dogs as well. All right, overcrowding situations. So shelters will often take in animals obtained from overcrowding situations. These animals tend to be unhealthy and for reasons that uh, because they are living in crowded situations, they may be living in cages, uh, poor nutrition, lack of vet care, poor air, um, lack of fresh water, inbreeding. Um, so on this slide, I just, I wanna take this opportunity to talk a little more about upper respiratory disease because we see so much of it and uh, potentially treat it a little differently than you would in, in private practice. So I know we all learned in school, uh, the, the players for upper respiratory, respiratory infections, herpes, Khaleesi virus, mycoplasma, chlamydia, and bordetella. So those are the, uh, we all know, viruses and bacteria that can cause it. In the shelter, I believe we have moved away from quarantining these cats. And the reason for that is now we know that stress can definitely be a contributing factor and it's stressful in shelters. And we know know also that these cats will recover better if they're in a home. Um, URIs can be chronic. And so if you're quarantining in a cat that has a chronic upper respiratory, you're never gonna get that poor cat out of the shelter and it's probably never gonna get better. So we, we adopt them out. Uh, URI, we know it's everywhere. Um, and it's, it's okay to adopt these URI kitties into homes that already have cats in them. It's, it's a little bit of a risk, but the risk is generally pretty low uh, because Cats in homes generally have immunity from previous infection or vaccination. They are not, and they are not stressed. Uh, we do recommend that the new adopted kitty be quarantined in the new home uh, for a period of time, about two weeks if they can, and slowly introduced to the, the other cat in the home. URI, we'll talk a little bit more about it. Uh, we, we treat with antivirals, antibiotics, and nebulization is the magic tool, <laughs> or one of them. We will nebulize with saline. Sometimes we'll need, use nebulization to deliver antibiotics as well, directly to the lungs. It can be helpful. Our main go-to antibiotic is doxycycline because this is the antibiotic that gets all three of these, these bad bugs, mycoplasma, chlamydia, and bordetella. We use a compounded liquid to get around the problem of the esophageal stricture that can happen with doxycycline that's in capsules. So for the conjunctivitis that we see in these guys, the main players in that disease are herpes and chlamydia, um, best treated with eryth erythromycin or oxytetracycline. So our go-to is teramycin. And then we'll also add on a uh, um, ocular antiviral. Sodofavir is great because this one can be used twice a day and in a shelter that's very handy to not have to dose something frequently. Uh, the cheaper al alternative is idoxyuridine, but ideally that needs to be dosed four times a day or more. So that one's a little tougher to do in a shelter um, situation. We send these kitties home with medication and a medical consult and a recommendation to follow up with their, their regular vet. All right. We certainly see plenty of dental disease in shelters. 
The ability to perform in-house dentals will depend on the resources of the shelter. At the SVCA, we have the equipment and the ability to perform dentals. However, uh, we lack the time to be able to perform routine dentals. Uh, we do occasionally perform the emergency dental. So, we have partnered with a few local practices to provide dental vouchers for adopted animals so that they can get their dentals. Um, this allows the animal to leave the shelter faster and the new adopter is a potential new client for that practice. So it really is a wonderful win-win for, for us and for those private practices. <clears throat> Anybody here who we are sending dentals to? Yes, thank you, yay, it's great. Then I don't have to do them. <laughs> All right. Um, one of the suggestions we got when we polled veterinarians uh, was that they asked us to talk about why shelters are moving away from testing cats for, for FEL VFIB. This could be an entire lecture by itself, so I will only touch on the main points here. Um, Basically, the recommendation is to stop testing all kitties for these two diseases and uh, the main reasons are the prevalence is actually pretty low. It depends on your, your locale, but generally only about 3% for both of these diseases. This disease is no longer a automatic euthanasia, both of them, FELV, FIV. Um, we now know that FELV can have three different forms, an abortive, regressive, and progressive form. So the abortive and regressive forms, uh, those cats can actually live fairly long, healthy lives, especially the abortive form. FIV cats can live long, healthy lives now, we know that too. Um, FELV and FIV cats can be housed with other cats, uh, particularly if the FIV cats are not big fighters. If they're the gentle giants, no problem living with other kitties. FELV, there is, there is a risk, uh, but it is fairly low. And in studies where they have housed cats together, they found that the transmission of the disease uh, was pretty low risk. Testing is still recommended if you're co-housing. Uh, there's AAFP guidelines that came out in 2020. And so, we, uh, we do still test all our cats over six months of age uh, for FIV and FELV. And part of the reason we do that is because we co-house the, the cats. We are well-funded enough that we can afford it and we feel like it is an added benefit for, for the adopter. If anybody wants to read the article, I have the, um, the link here in the slide and you can email us after the presentation we can send you send you that as well all right okay let's talk about surgery <laughs> and everybody chuckles at this picture <laughs> um, the bulk of our surgeries are spay and neuter uh, at the SPCA we perform spay and neuter on all our uh, in-house in-house uh, animals dogs and cats and we also offer an affordable spay and neuter program for the general public. We do approximately 100 surgeries per week. <laughs> um, unlike private practice, we do not have the leeway to wait until animals are older for spay and neuter because we have to take into account our goal of population control, length of stay, and Nevada state law that dictates that all animals uh, must be spayed and neutered prior to adoption. So in general, uh, shelter surgeons are comfortable spaying and neutering animals at eight weeks of age and two pounds. And the beauty of this is that these little critters recover almost instantly. When they're awake, they're like, oh, nothing happened and they're out the door. Whereas with the older, larger animals, you know, their recovery can be a little bit, a little bit rougher. Um, typically uh, in a shelter, it's a high quality, high volume type of situation 
where surgeries are done uh, quickly. We, have, we make small incisions and we have well-trained, efficient teams. And everybody knows if you do the same thing, day in and day out, you get really, really good at it. Um, the monitoring equipment varies depending on the shelter that you're in. Uh, it can, in our, our facility, we do actually have a full monitor and blood pressure and temperature everything going um, by the time the tech gets it all set set up we're done with the surgery and they're having to un unhook the an animal but it's nice to have all that equipment um, I when I went to vet school I was taught a pre scrotal neuter and it wasn't until I was working in a high volume setting that I switched over to doing uh, scrotal castrations and um, I do them because they are faster, at least for me, and the complication rate is similar, if not less, than with pre-scrotal castrations. So you may, you may see dogs with scrotal castrations and uh, just realize that it may be partially open, uh, left open, to, and that helps with some drainage if there is some there. Uh, essentially with these surgeries, you close the sub-Q layer and then the skin layer may or may not be closed uh, and may or may not be glued. So with all our surgeries, uh, we also tattoo everybody. So I want to talk uh, about the importance of tattoos for a moment. Here's a case of a cat that came to us from a transfer shelter. And that transfer paperwork indicated that Dixie was a spayed female. And so we pulled her into the clinic to do our spay check and shaved her belly to look for a spay scar or a tattoo, and there was none. So she was anesthetized uh, for surgery, and during the prep, it was discovered that Dixie was a neutered male. So, Dixon. <laughs> so, if he'd had a tattoo on his belly, he wouldn't have been anesthetized in the first place. And I just wanna, just wanna say that no owner uh, plans to lose or surrender their animal, but it happens. And tattoos can per, um, sorry, prevent a unnecessary surgery. And that's part of why we do it in the, in the sheltering world. And this is a great example of why we tattoo males on their abdomen, um, not down near their scrotum, or you can do both places, which I sometimes do, but the abdomen, this is uh, a, a great reason why. And he came into our shelter just a few months ago. All right, I wanna talk about tattoos because uh, it didn't occur to me until I saw this Facebook post from a general practice veterinarian um, talking about how do you tattoo, uh, I, I didn't realize that it wasn't common knowledge. And it's certainly not something that I was taught in vet school. So the good news is that it's really cheap and really easy. And so I'll just explain kind of what I do. Um, this tube of tattoo ink is about $15 and will last you a year, maybe two. A little goes a long way and gets all, all over everything. <laughs> but essentially super easy. I take my blade, I dip it in the ink, I make a superficial skin incision, I drop a little glue in there, I squeeze it closed with a little bit of gauze, which kind of soaks up the excess glue and ink, and voila, you have a beautiful tattoo. I do also make tattoos off midline, and that is in case that animal has an abdominal surgery later in life, your surgeon isn't gonna take out your tattoo because a surgery here at SVS or at um, AEC is probably not gonna take the time to put your tattoo back in. <laughs> Next, all right. Oh, I went ahead, <laughs> who do? All right. We do a lot of surgery in the shelter and what surgeries we do will depend on uh, the experience and skill set of the individual veterinarian. But some of the common things that we do uh, are mass removals, we do pyometras, um, 
lacerations, definitely do enucleations, plenty of those, entropions, looking for polyps, eyelid atresia in little kittens, uh, amputations, prolapses, cherry eyes, uh, perineal urethrostomies, <clears throat> etc. So just one thing that I do want to talk about is that some of these surgeries may be considered uh, a little bit earlier in the course of treatment, depending on the resources and the length of stay. We always have to take that into consideration in the shelter. So an example is a dog with a leg fracture. This dog may end up getting an amputation instead of having the fracture repaired. And the reason for this is that individual, sh individual shelter may not have access to a specialist or a skilled veterinarian that can perform that orthopedic surgeon surgery. They may have lack of funding for that surgery or also importantly, they may lack the, the space um, or the resources for the recovery for that animal. So there may be not be a foster that can take it. In the shelter, recovery may not be practical because of time, space, staffing, and uh, rehabilitation. So a dog with an amputation can basically go home that day or the next day, uh, and, and they can heal at home, and then we can get another animal in the shelter. All right, this is kind of a gory slide, so sorry, there's queasy stomachs in the audience. Um, like surgeons everywhere, we have to contend with post-op complications and some of these you might end up seeing in animals adopted from a shelter. I've list listed them in order of urgent, immediately life-threatening to mild will resolve. And I'll just kind of go through the list a little bit. Hemoabdomen. If you do an, enough spay and neuter surgery, you're probably going to see a hemoabdomen during your career. Uh, these require immediate surgery and auto transfusion. If you haven't performed an auto transfusion, it is pretty straightforward. You basically need a blood filter. You suck the blood out of the abdomen, you put it through a filter and right back into the dog's vein, and it's magic for them, for sure. Uh, Uterine artery erosion. This is, thank gosh, not one that I've seen, but it is something that uh, I have learned about. And, and apparently this can happen when the suture around the uterine stump starts to dissolve, uh, can break down the, um, the uterine arteries and your, your dog can start to have internal bleeding and you end up with a hemoabdomen, same situation, you need to take that dog back to surgery, uh, plus or minus an, an auto transfusion. How soon after surgery does that usually occur? Uh, oh, I even put that in my notes, but it can happen um, up to like a week after surgery. So, uh, uterine stump granulomas, <laughs> this is also something I never heard of uh, before I got into shelter medicine. Uh, granulomas are seen in dogs that were in heat or pregnant at the time of spay, and it's postulated that, the, um, that it is due to testosterone's effects on the tissues or a suture reaction at the uterine stump. They can be treated with uh, non-steroidal anti-inflammatories, plus or minus antibiotics, and just given time to resolve. Um, however, if the granuloma it continues to bleed or becomes infected, then that becomes a surgical, a surgical case. And the photos on the slide, the ultrasound, and then the photo above it, uh, these are a, a uterine stump granuloma uh, the one above it was, an inf was infected and turned into an abscess, and you can see where the omentum <coughs> has kind of started to adhere to it. A lot going on in that picture, but it was a pretty, it was a pretty big one. Uh, next up, we have a scrotal hematoma, and these can occur immediately post-op, 
up to about one to three days after surgery. Typically the bleeding is from within the scrotum. Uh, often on a dog that has probably been a little bit too active post-op. These will usually resolve within seven to 14 days, but if they are severe and painful for the dog, then um, they turn into a surgical, uh, surgical case and scrotal ablation is, is uh, necessary. This is a picture uh, that I had from back in 2015. So this was not a dog here in Reno. My staff wanted to make sure that I said that. <laughs> <laughs> All right, uh, seromas and suture reactions. These are somewhat run of the mill. We see them, uh, they tend to resolve within about 14 days. Warm compressing can kind of help, help that resolve. Usually not something that you have to go in and drain or, or repeat your surgery, you take it out and, and redo it. Okay, if your client brings you a kitty cat that they complain has been really vocal, really affectionate, um, but supposedly it's spayed, just always keep in the back of your mind ovarian remnant because it is a possibility. And um, there's uh, testing that you can do, uh, AMH testing, anti-mullerian hormone testing, pretty straightforward blood test. You can send that directly to UC Davis. I believe Cornell does it. And I think you can also send it through IDEX or Antec as well. Uh, I, I think it's pretty handy. Um, it'll say positive, negative. Uh, if it's positive, then you probably have an ovarian remnant and you're gonna wanna do surgery, go back in, do an explore. And it's best to do that when the animal is in heat then the tissues will be inflamed and a little bit easier to find. Kind of go in near the kidney and usually it'll be right there saying, hello, I'm here. <laughs> All right, uh, I'll talk a little bit about behavior. Uh, behavior is the number one reason for relinquishment at the shelter. And uh, this it definitely could be a whole lecture by itself, so I'm just kind of touching on the highlights. Um, like I said, we do behavior assessments and we do um, behavior modification in our facility. Uh, the medications that I reach for, that we reach for, are trazodone, gabapentin, melatonin, alprazolam, zilkine. You can you can see the list there. We'll utilize everything in our in our toolbox that we can. I like clonidine for dogs with high arousal. Clonidine is a human medication that is used for um, hypertension and ADHD in, in people. For dogs, what it does is it just kind of brings them down to a level where they can focus, where they can like pay attention to the lessons that they're receiving in their behavior modification classes. Um, it also calms them down a little bit. You have to watch a little bit because it can cause hypotension uh, I haven't seen that yet though in using it. For separation anxiety and other phobias, uh, we might reach for fluoxetine or uh, Clomacom, but these drugs do take a while to show effect, like four to six weeks. So we'll use them in conjunction with drugs like trazodone and um, gabapentin. You'll always read the warnings about watching out for serotonin syndrome. Uh, I have yet to see that but it is always on, in the back of my mind, okay, I've got this animal on both these drugs. We need to be kind of paying attention for that. Ideally, uh, you would wean them off the shorter acting drug like the trazodone when after the fluoxetine or clomacom sort of take over and then you continue with that. We'll send home a medical consult uh, with a follow-up uh, for the regular veterinarian to work with that adopter to alter those medications. Hopefully those dogs can actually fully come off of those medications after they're in a home and, and out of the shelter environment. We do behavior modification in-house. Uh, we work with Kelly Bolin, who is a phenomenal behaviorist. Uh, she comes into the shelter and gives lectures to our staff uh, she works with our in-house population of dogs 
and uh, she is available for adopters. We actually offer one free hour uh, with Kelly Bolin to all of our, um, with all of our adopted animals. So that's a really great benefit uh, and a really wonderful resource. So we do occasionally do humane euthanasia at the SPCA. Like um, Dr. Healy mentioned earlier, we have a selective intake, but occasionally we do have animals that are just not responding to our behavior modification program. We have a committee that meets. Uh, that committee is comprised of a veterinarian, uh, Jill, the executive director, and uh, three of our managers. And so we meet, we sit down, we discuss uh, the cases, we go through the entire history of everything that has been tried, all the potential alternatives for, for that animal. Um, and if, if we de deem that that animal is unadoptable into our community for you know, whatever reason, then we will do um, humane euthanasia. The Animal Welfare Committee also meets for some of those harder medical cases as well. You know, what are we what are we going to do with this case uh, if it is going to end up being a hospice case or if it's time for euthanasia or a um, like a hospice foster uh, we do have a dog that went into hospice foster uh, about two years ago <laughs> that's the magic of getting animals into homes sometimes they can do really well Crombie Cynthia you probably know it little mama little she's mama. still kicking yeah. All right. After animals are adopted, uh, they are hopefully on their way to their new vet. Uh, these are some of the things we would like our private practice partners to keep in mind when seeing newly adopted dogs or cats. Sometimes we throw a lot of information at the adopter and they may not have understood or retained much of what was said at the time of adoption. And so we are relying on the pet's new vet to continue to work with the owner. We do have a policy that uh, we will sometimes provide additional medications or treatments uh, for animals that were adopted. Uh, we try to keep that to about a two week window. If it's been longer than two weeks, then we might say, um, sorry, but you need to go to your regular vet. In times like this, where it's really hard to get an appointment with a veterinarian, um, we'll sometimes extend that, that service out a little bit longer. We'll, we'll refill medications or see animals for continued upper respiratory or, or things like that. Uh, our spay-neuter agreement with our public, so our public spay-neuter program, that agreement does state that the owner needs to follow up with a regular veterinarian for any complications resulting from the spay or neuter. And we don't do this to be mean or to try to shirk our duty or anything like that. We do this simply because of time and resources. Um, we, we just don't generally have the time to, to devote to all the follow-up care. So um, we are relying on our private practice partners to be able to kind of pick that up and, and go with it um, and s support each other that way. So I put up this slide um, just after a first vet visit, after adoption, things to think about. Um, this is a opportunity to gain a lifelong client. They're coming to you with their new pet. They're very excited about it. Um, and I've talked about the limitations that some shelters are under. They may come to you uh, with a problem that either the vet didn't know about because the animal never saw the vet in the shelter, or um, there was limited resources to be able to work that animal up uh, thoroughly. The animal may be on medications that aren't typically used in private practice. We talked about the upper respiratory and how we treat it. Uh, the pet may, may need recommended follow-up care. Ask for the medical records. Hopefully the new uh, owner brings them with them uh, to the appointment uh, because there's lots of information in there and they'll, they won't remember what we told them. So hopefully they bring their records with them to the first appointment. We talked about common uh, spay-neuter complications and 
and so um, know, know about those. And we're all in this together, so if you have questions or even constructive feedback, please give us a call. Just reach out and say, hey, why'd you do this? Or I saw this patient um, that was adopted from your facility. Uh, it's having this problem now. You know, can you give me a little more background about what's going on? So we, we would love to work together to help our animals in our community. All right. So, I believe all veterinarians share the same goals when it comes to keeping animals healthy and in loving homes. Uh, when I was working in private practice, one of my greatest joys was being able to provide uh, help for those owners uh, when they were in difficult times, whether that was uh, financial help or medical help for, for their pet. Um, these are some of the things that private practice veterinarians can do uh, to support our goal. Support, uh, do spay and neuter, and hopefully tattoo. Convince those owners that they'll never see the tattoo because the hair will grow over it. It's not a big deal. Encourage adoption uh, versus buying. Uh, direct owners to financial resources, like the ones that Jill mentioned, particularly Todd's Fund. Now you all know about it. It's a it's a wonderful, a wonderful thing. And insurance, consider telling people about insurance. Uh, insurance can make the difference in a pet's life. Uh, can really, really make the difference between whether it gets euthanized because of financial reasons or, or not. So considering incremental care. This is a concept you're probably, everybody's familiar with, I, I feel like, but basically you have a plan B, or sorry, plan A, plan B, and plan C for that owner. Sometimes this can be a little bit more labor intensive, but you can work with an owner to come up with a plan that hopefully meets or fits their financial budget and um, still, still help that animal, make everybody happy. Recognize the human-animal bond and support that concept in our, our society. Um, provide options so that people of all income levels can enjoy the health benefits of owning a pet. And counsel on surrender or humane euthanasia if those are truly the only options. Um, I know it's a really difficult decision to make to euthanize a healthy animal for uh, a behavior issue. I've been there. Um, I've had those hard conversations with owners, and uh, in the in those times when I've trusted the owner and we've had a good conversation about it, I've gone ahead and euthanized that dog because I've realized that that animal is not safe out in the community. So I encourage you to do the humane euthanasia thing before that animal ends up in the shelter and ends up getting euthanized anyway. All right, so on that happy note, <laughs> sorry about that. <laughs> Questions? Questions, comments, we love it. So for my interest, do you guys stuff any little Do you guys hold back on still staying in heat? Do you know? I've never heard of them. I'm used to seeing skin heat stage it, or females get stayed all the time. So do you guys hold back? Is that new? Can you I think, a little more about that? <laughs> I think that's a great question. So did everybody hear the question? No, we don't. We go ahead and spay and neuter those dogs that are in heat or pregnant. And it's that length of stay kind of situation. So it is, a complication we know about it's a little bit of a roll of the dice but um, if you know and can anticipate something like that you can kind of be on the on the lookout for it is it pretty common I so I want to say no however do that. <laughs> in like in the last two months we've had three yeah, I read a paper somewhere, and this was about a year ago, but it, I think it was that dogs over uh, deep chested type breeds, over 50 pounds, uh, spayed while pregnant or in heat, had a 50% chance of developing it. 
Um, I could be totally misquoting that, but <laughs> um, I had a case that presented um, where it was a, a, a German shepherd uh, that was anorexic and just going downhill, so presented for not eating and dehydration, and that's what it ended up being. So, yeah, it, it, it's uh, something you don't think about until it's right in front of your face. And you're like, oh, yeah, you don't stop granuloma. I forgot about you. So, yeah, I've something. Never heard of it, so that's pretty interesting. But, uh, for you, for sure. Mm -hmm. um, and then, Becky's question being resources Is there any resources out there for. Um, we do a lot of amputations for the background of the cough. It's not low cost, right? The downside is we do Have you talked to Beth Williams no. with um, <laughs> Animal Wellness? I have not. Beth Williams? Yeah, you can at least talk to her. She's been willing to um, help with some rescues in the past. I don't know what her availability for that is at the time. But can you say the name of Beth Williams out there? She's in South Reno. Yeah, is it? She's an animal physical therapist. Okay, so, I'll look into that. Okay. Uh, those recent three stuff granulomas, how long ago were they stayed? If you know, I'm just curious. The the one we have right now actually was spayed on May 5th. And what's today? The 12th? Because um, that happened pretty She good. started having uh, reports of bloody urine uh, a couple days ago. And so she's having a bloody, a little bit of a bloody discharge from, from her vulva. And I just ult ultrasounded her today. And she's, she's, got a, she's got a granuloma there. And so we have her on um, antibiotics and carprofen. And we're just we're just monitoring. And I also sent out a urinalysis on her, just to make sure. Yeah. So they're usually that quick. For some reason, I was thinking it would be longer term. Than I think it's within about a week or so. Mm -hmm. Correct me. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know if there's studies out th out there about them. Um, we'll have to find the paper. We'll have to look. Yeah. <laughs> find the paper. <laughs> How about an NHS? Are you guys seeing them there? Could you experience? Yeah. And I would take her probably within a week. Either have a recent stay and then stroking go like when you're palpating around the bladder. You know, a lot of times you'll feel like a baseball size mass and then stuck right All right. Well, great. Yeah. Thank you. 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 Thank you.